Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 567. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday the 17th of January 2020. Okay, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, not a lot of you out there, but there's some. Check the analytics. Welcome to another program. Uh, all right, yes, Gavin is miniaturized over the, here on the far right because his computer died and he's graciously using his iPhone. Hope you're not using the data plan there because that would be really bad. No, no, folks, re in reality, uh, Gavin is a junior partner, though that he's, he's not an Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> he's been reduced to junior I, partner. I, I'm occupying my proper proportion on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we want to do the show anyway. Uh, hopefully we can get his uh, computer back online for Monday's show. But uh, until then, we have uh, miniaturized Gavin and two big heads who are full of themselves on the left here. So that's just us. We need to talk about news before we do that. Please like the episode that you're watching by clicking the thumbs up, either on Facebook or YouTube. Share this with your friends, bishops, anybody higher up than you, just share it up the, up the chain. They need to know what's happening in the Anglican world as much as you do, or down the chain. If you're a bishop or archbishop, give it to everybody. Just send out a big welcome email to Anglican Unscripted viewers. What else? I need you to subscribe. You guys really did well last week. We had like 100 new subscribers after that episode. Really appreciate that. And let's move on to the news. We kind of had a brief talk about what topics we we're going to talk about, but then everything started crashing and Gavin lost his connection. We're back online. Gavin or, or George, what do we decide on news? Well, Gavin was going to do give a brief update on part two of the Peter Ball saga. Yeah. We are going to talk about the uh, ACNA College of Bishops meeting mm -hmm. and the primates meeting. And then I was going to try to sneak in Indian corruption somewhere. Oh, somewhere. So, Gavin, if you're on, <laughs> tell us the update. Okay. Well, there really isn't very much to say, which perhaps is a good thing. The, uh, the, the, in terms of the BBC production, everything had been revealed in the first half, and the second half was simply um, a, a development of what, of what was said. So there was, there was nothing new, except that it reinforced the impression that the hierarchy of that particular period was uh, at the very least incompetent and maybe worse than incompetent, perhaps a mixture of incompetence and very, very poor motivation amounting to irresponsibility, carelessness, institutional myopia. Um, and a lot of people who saw the program in the public space have been saying how angry they were. The official Church of England response was a, a statement by Bishop Peter Hancock, who uh, said how sorry he was and then said what people say all the time, which is lessons will be learned or have been learned. Um, I don't think actually to his credit, he used that phrase, but it was in that pattern of uh, disclosure. And then what happened was, uh, although I don't follow many bishops of the Church of England on my Twitter feed, I follow half a dozen and all the, um, all the socially responsible ones uh, put out a tweet saying how disgusted they were. So. Uh, this this was the the uh, this was the appropriate reaction of of everyone trying to distance themselves those who belonged and took responsibility in the organisation distancing themselves from what happened before. I think one of the questions is will the victims be helped in this? I had some emails from from people who had been talking to me over the years, and they said thank you for talking about it on Unscripted. Don't ever stop nothing's changed nothing's happened and nothing's changed well um, the, I, I i need to piggyback that you know the church has learned a lot in two thousand years and i know the acna has programs where you can't even volunteer in the library of a church without going through uh, some training about uh predators what to watch out for um you know the type of people who want to turn up at your church and seek for the vulnerable well, the training has two aspects, because we have that in the Episcopal Church, and I assume the Church of England has that sort of stuff. The first is the training for the volunteer, and to be perfectly frank, uh, 
pedophiles and perverts know how to answer questions appropriately because they're able to function in society and haven't been locked up. But the deeper training, which is what is lacking, is how leaders and management can respond and supervise this. Because uh, I don't mean to be unkind, but the response from the bishops on Twitter of the Church of England uh, smacked more of virtue signaling. Look, I'm appropriately outraged. I've not done anything before, and I'm not going to do anything again. But here, after this has received the spotlight from uh, television, I'm going to be outraged. But, I, but I'm not going to do anything about it, or I'm not going to do the hard work of changing the culture to see that it never happens. Now, is that cynical, Gavin, or is that... No, I, I mean, I, that was exactly my response as well. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's what I thought too. I mean, they had to do it. I don't blame them for doing it. It's a form of public insurance policy. Uh, why shouldn't they have public insurance policy like anybody else? But, but, but I think my objection is the shimmerer that somehow things are going to change because of it. I mean, Fletcher was still around and preaching and ignoring the system, despite the fact that five years ago, a whole load of safeguarding was put in place and every parish has to say something about it on his website and have a safeguarding officer. But that didn't make any difference to the fact that Jonathan Fletcher was still going, was still teaching. Now, Jonathan is not a terrible uh, um, man. He's, he's stepped over some boundaries and inappropriate ways and left some wounded people. I, my sense is that that you can't institutionally catch up with sin. So uh, not everyone will agree with me on this, but but I think my view is you can't deal with sin by wagging your finger and, and, and taking precautions. You should always take precautions. Of course you should. Any organization should make sure that pedophiles can't get near children and that, that there are a safe place to come to report things. Um, but the real the real work seems to me to be actually uh, a a greater sensitivity to 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 what sin is. I mean, for example, the route that we're going down at the moment, the, the people are going to get very cross with what I'm about to say, and I'm sorry about that. The route that we're going down at the moment is an increasing acceptance of of uh, the gay agenda. Now, most of the gay people I know are fine, upright, kind, good, responsible men, very often in their 60s and the and, and, and the, the, the fires of excitement have gone out. But nonetheless, uh, there is a close relationship between uh, b between homosexuality and paedophilia, mainly for men, not for women. Um, but but the, the stuff that we see happening, uh, certainly in the Catholic Church, has been um, gay men preying on adolescent boys a particular kind of, of predatory behavior. Now, how do you stop that by having safeguarding or by having lay training or by having signals on a website? I, I don't think you can. I think the real changes in the church, after you've done all the sensible things which should be done, uh, ought to be a, a, a clear sense that there has to be a sense of spiritual and hygiene, and, uh, so spiritual and sexual hygiene, so that the church says, it's not just a matter of stopping occasional abusers. It's a matter of spring cleaning our whole, you know, what it is to be a Christian, what it, what it is to, to, to understand sexuality in the church. And on the one hand, we're saying, okay, no more predators, let's do safeguarding. On the other hand, I'd say particularly in both the Catholic and the Anglican churches, there's a constant move towards a, a freeing up of the sexualization of the church through, first of all, a promotion of homosexuality, and after that, even if there's no necessary link, through the um, understanding of paedophilia. The moment you say, I was born like this, you can't easily make a distinction between uh, an innate sexual attraction, someone of the same sex. And uh, as a paedophile said the other day on the internet, I'm, I was born a nine-year-old girl. That's, my, that's where my sexual attraction lies. As soon as you accept this whole basis, I was born that way, um, you can't practice sexual and spiritual hygiene in an organization like the church. Well, I have bad news for you, Gavin. When I check the Twitter feeds of the Roman Catholic bishops and the Episcopal bishops and the bishops in the uh, Anglican communion, I see activism. I see, oh, guys show up at the uh, cathedral. We're going to have teaching on climate change because we can effectively increase the numbers of our membership and effectively engage culture and effectively change the world 
by preaching the gospel of climate change. I see nothing about uh, uh, sexual issues or immorality issues. I see social justice, Christian warriorism. That's all I see. I would have. That, and, sorry, Kevin. Go on, go on George. Yeah, go, Gab. Yeah. Uh, Sir George, you going to say something? Uh, yes, I want to respond to Kevin, and then I want to respond to Gavin, <laughs> because I agree and I disagree, and part of my disagreements is that my thoughts are not fully formed, and I really don't know the sociology and the biology well enough to s say anything other than conventional wisdom. But in my own, in within the last three weeks, uh, two priests who are Episcopal priests, uh, one two two Anglican priests in the United States of uh, one belongs to one denomination, the other belongs to the other denomination. One fellow is my age, mid-50s, went to class together at Yale, he got a PhD, he was had a meteoric career, he was going to be a bishop one day, he's a cardinal rector of a northern parish, one of these huge things. And uh, the announcement was put out that uh, he has voluntarily uh, submitted to discipline over uh, some issue that uh, they didn't really want to enunciate and I've known this guy for 20 25 plus years and he has always been touchy-feely it's not homosexual this guy just he's married he has children but here's somebody who just can't leave the ladies alone now I can't tell you how many classes and how many years and how much common sense we all have about adultery is not something you do as a priest uh, yet here is somebody who is trained to the nines who allegedly uh, has uh, fallen uh, sway to sin and then the other one was a young man of my acquaintance who was a youth minister that my wife actually hired gave him his first youth ministry job he went on to become ordained and he uh, was unmarried and he slept with his girlfriend and the girlfriend wanted to get married he said no she complained to his bishop and now he's been suspended for a year um, both of these guys are not homosexual. They're not, they're not, if you will, the classic example of predators. Yet both of them betray their ordination vows as unambiguously as, uh, well, so as almost we, as badly we, as Peter Ball. So if we forget my, forget for the moment, my making, making a link between, uh, well, I, I still, I still think that the born this way is, is a, is a, a series of dotted lines which ends up in a terrible place um, but essentially what we're saying is you can't deal with sin by rules well we've always known that and and you can't deal by sin by wagging your finger and posting a sign after the fact yeah exactly and that's in other words one of the things i read on twitter is that uh, and facebook and in the email conversations is that you know there's one fellow who's very active uh, in the uh, safeguarding mandate who was abused eight years ago by a, a priest of the Church of England and this has been public for years and he has still not yet received uh, an apology or support or paying for for counseling or anything the church okay, in well other words, the, 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 the bishops the, and then in this case it's Archbishop Justin Welby make all the right noises at our primates meeting in Amman Jordan there was a little thing about taking care of those who are suffering and victims and one of the quick responses was from one of the victims of abuse saying well why don't you return my calls after eight years I think Peter Hancock has been very good uh, at, at trying to express uh, empathy uh, I've seen him in General Synod and I uh, and he, he's, he's a kind and conscientious man and uh, having to be in charge of safeguarding for the Church of England is a terrible job for anybody to have. But, but one man, by being empathetic, can't do it all. It still seems there are a good many people uh, at the centre of the organisation who make life more difficult for victims rather than less difficult. And, 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 and I, don't, I just don't understand how an organisation can be that atrophied. It's, it's, it's so obvious. I'm going to make a, a harsh statement and say those individuals at the center are Johnson Tambu and Justin Welby. Uh, Martin Sewell, an advocate for the abused at the last General Synod, tried to bring this forward. And the archbishops have the, the right, the ability to bring this up, to discuss safeguarding. And it was the archbishops who de de declined to act. 
decline to bring this out into the open, but just allow it to be subsumed by whatever, you know, mosquito net lit, you know, things I'm sure that are all worthy for the people who are proposing it. But their sense of urgency and priority over the cancer that is abuse, Welby and Sintamu have not been that aggressive uh, in, the, the, in the eyes of the victims and in the advocates. Um, and one of the institutional flaws is I saw a document the other day showing that uh, there were a dozen uh, hierarchs of the Church of England, bishops and deans, who were directors of the Ecclesiastical Insurance Company, the insurance company that's dealing with the payouts. And, and I was just astonished because the level of conflict of interest is just so, so grotesque that um, something should have been done about this a long time ago. They should have swept, swept off the EIO, all the people who had responsibility pastorally or managerially in the organization and replaced them with other people. But, but, but that has, I don't, I don't know if it can be done. If there's, there are, uh, if there are rules within the constitutional setup of the ecclesiastical uh, insurance office, it doesn't allow that to happen. But, but if so, and people should have said so, but anyway, for the moment, it remains a serious conflict of interest. And one of those examples of, of institutional compromise that appears to, to, to look very bad. Well, I think your point about Peter Hancock's personal integrity is well said. I've not heard anything to the contrary. But he is in an impossible position because he's been given responsibility for safeguarding, but he has no executive authority. He has no authority to do anything, to institute anything. It's he, He's been given, he's been, he's been asked to be the apologist and spokesman, not to be the, the point man to make this stuff proper and good which is interesting because i remember back in the late 70s and early 80s when the roman catholic uh news on pedophiles within the the priesthood started to break it was horrible but then every six years you see the the story rehash itself as there's new discoveries and new discoveries when will we as a church roman catholic Protestant, Anglican, tech. when will we finally have a solution to this where we don't put predators in the pulpit? Well, I think this is too. I mean, I, I don't want to over-spiritualize, but I, but I can't help it. <laughs> I, 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 I see both the Catholic and the well, I was saying I don't want to be facile. <laughs> That's right. I, I can repent of being mean, but I may not be able to help being facile and superficial. I, I was saying that I see it. I, I, I can't help but spiritualize the thing. Um, the, 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 I mean, the fact is human sexuality is messy and we're all sinners. So that, there's nothing new in any of that, which is what I think George was saying earlier on. The difficulty I have is that there seems to have been a particular assault that has to do with sexuality and actually homosexuality in both the Catholic and the Anglican churches. And so in the Catholic church, it, it expresses itself in the, in the presence of the lavender mafia. And everyone says, well, it's there and it works. And uh, it keeps on getting special favors, perhaps even uh, at the highest level of the Vatican. Why hasn't that been changed? And then we see within the Anglican church, a constant normalization of uh, the breaking down of heterosexual ethics and values in favor of promotion of uh, of a chloroform form of sexuality, um, but but we know that that goes in the in the opposite direction of of holiness and um, sanctity and stability. So it it strikes me that the struggle that the Catholic that the, both the Catholic and the Anglican churches are having with sexuality is a profoundly problematic one, and it's not at all clear we're winning it. And and just and safeguarding won't do it. I mean, safeguarding is good. You can't not have it, but it won't win the battle. Now, Gavin, I have to tell you, the Bishop of Niagara, Susan Bell, will have nothing to do with sanctity and stability and holiness and all these things, because the answer for the church, it's what Kevin, I think, was alluding to earlier in his comment, is that if we, begi if we begin to evangelize about climate change, then we're going to turn around our decline in numbers and we're going to recapture our place within the culture. Forget this holiness nonsense. Forget this Bible stuff. We've got to be the church that's what's happening now. Yeah, a cultural church. What is the Bishop of uh... Niagara, Canada, Niagara. Yeah. Susan Bell. She's special. 
All right, so well, let's move <laughs> let's move along here before I have a uh, Mrs. But isn't Angel that what Stephen Cottrell was saying? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, I was going to say that it actually yeah. sums up the flavor of the whole of the Church of England, as far as I can see. Both Cottrell and Welby, uh, mm -hmm. are, are on behalf of a whole lot of others, are making uh, making that kind of spiritual point. And if and, and if it's not climate change, well, then it's socialist politics. Uh, mm -hmm. It's some, you know the form of, of, of progressive utopianism. But but for as long as the Church concentrates, I think on on politics, it fails to deal with the with the hygiene of the soul and i think it's the hygiene of the soul that is that is the key to fighting this particular struggle in which the church looks as though it's being very badly compromised i saw a video released by uh i don't know if it's church house or lambeth oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that pretty much said listen the discussion's over we're done talking about this you guys need to accept same-sex marriage, the the culture that supports same-sex marriage, the politics of same-sex marriage, it's just going to be part of our church from now and and we have a video to help you explain to your congregations and those who may be uh, concerned about this how to deal with it. And right. I'm going to post can't, a link in the show notes. It, actually, it's on Anglican Inc. We uh, oh, did post, it posted it up there. Yeah. But I actually, there are, is a silver lining to this, Kevin. Hmm. Yeah. The silver lining is that for the first time in a long time, the Church of England used the word evil, that something evil. was evil. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is traditional views of human sexuality and faith. That is what's evil. <laughs> evil. <laughs> but still, the Church of England has resurrected its voc the word evil and placed it back into its vocabulary. The church pastoral... Uh, I don't know the full moniker, but it's a it's a committee spearheaded by the Bishop of Newcastle, uh, Hardiman, I forget her first name. Uh, it's a female bishop from Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you can watch the video on Anglican Inc. Kevin will have it in the have it in our notes. And basically that. it's uh, friends in England sent this to me the moment it came out and saying this is the softening up of that live, uh, living living it sounds like a Julia living Roberts in, movie, <clears throat> living love uh, with lattes on love shoots in Luton. Shoot, love I don't shoots know. eat greens. And, it's living in living in love and faith. I think is is the yeah, title. Yeah. But basically, uh, this is uh, this is what's going to come out with that, which is uh, sort of a Rodney King. Why can't we all get along? And only the people who have absolutes, they're evil. They're haters. We see where this is going. I'm told. Well, one or two people were quite cross with me that I was dare to say that Roger Scruton's problem was that he, he wasn't born again. And, you know, how would you know? And how dare you? And he's baptized. And and um, the difficulty is that I I, I feel, I, I continue to feel more and more strongly that being born, born in the spirit and seeing things in the dimension of the kingdom of heaven is an absolute prerequisite to the church. And, and, and the church's sacraments are the launch pad for this but just because you've received the sacraments doesn't mean you stop there there has to be this growth into into holiness and metanoia and this is the spring cleaning that i'm i'm talking about um so if we go back to say that you can't deal with sin by regulation you can only deal with sin by 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 a journey into holiness and and progressive politics is takes you in the other direction one Let's comment Try. Are you, are you, well, on. I just want to want to step forward from one of the little comments. Gavin uh, Gavin was uh, uh, upbraided by someone who uh, uh, claimed that uh, Gavin could not read uh, Roger Scruton's soul or no, not know his eternal fate. Gavin quite clearly, though, articulated these are the man's public statements and views, so we can probably we don't want to by listening to what he has to say. Yeah, no, somebody, I, else, somebody asked about uh, René Girard, the French-American uh, mm. uh, philosopher. I happen to have been a student among many. I was not close or anything like that. Was Girard, who is probably the most uh, de rigueur... I mean, if you really want to be on the progressive, not in liberal sense, but if you really want to be cutting-edge theologically, Girard was it. He still is. His uh, theory is of mimetic French. desire. French or French. He... Yeah. he he was an atheist uh, who, uh, in uh, middle age, as he began working in these areas, 
returned to full fellowship with the Catholic Church. And under the Catholic Church's definitions, he is saved. Uh, received the sacrament before his death. He was a communicant, went to confession. And this is as a French philosopher as it's possible to be. So don't think all these uh, high flyers are uh, atheists in their own little worlds. Probably one of the greatest of the 20th century. Uh, it's a very lovely piece of <clears throat> very lovely piece of poetry when it comes to salvation uh, from the 19th century, and I forget who the author is, but it says it's a guy who's riding his horse and he's about to have an accident to break his neck and die. So he gets thrown from the horse and he prays for forgiveness, and it goes between the stirrup and the ground. He mercy sought and mercy found, and and I'm absolutely fine by that. I don't intend to be able to set myself up as a judge of other people's salvation. So we're no, not no, discussing that, that is my people. role on this show, Gavin. That, <laughs> yeah, that is my role. We're not discussing whether people get saved or not. What we're discussing is whether or not they use the language of the kingdom of heaven, which is what Jesus did in the gospels. The gospels are all about moving, shifting paradigms from politics and the flesh to to the, the spirit and the kingdom. And my beef with the church is that that it it fails to follow the paradigm of Jesus in the Gospels. Well, one of the funny things I just Often. wanted to mention with Scruton and Girard is that Girard is an avowed, up until his death, I think in 2015 or 16, Girard was a communicant, faithful in, in his Catholic life and witness, Christian life and witness. Um, but Scruton's public writings are more accessible to Orthodox Christianity than Girard's are. In other words, mm -hmm. The one scholar who uh, people laud his uh, laud Scruton's uh, devotion to the prayer book and mm. to the to the structures and the trappings and the logic of Christianity, that is more valuable on one level than Girard's work. But Girard was the one who would make the confessional statement without hesitation, mm. whereas Scruton never quite did. That's a great point. As long as we're going all in on church corruption. Church corruption is not just sexual. Uh, sin corruption within the in the church. And I wanted to, we always joke about Indian corruption. I think we have enough good stories this week that we could talk about in general and specifically about the corruption that we're seeing over in, in this church. Um, uh, George, you've been writing some stories. Uh, why don't you have at it? I've been writing stories about corruptions in the Church of South India, the Church of North India, the Church of Pakistan, for about 20 odd years. Uh, it's a very bad situation. The newly elected uh, 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 charges. The current primate, uh, who was just elected on Friday of last week, he uh, was one of the cleaner candidates. He only has, he's only facing one criminal charge where he has been accused by the State Medical Commission in Tamil Nadu, which is a southern state, of selling admission places to a church-run medical school and pocketing money paid by middle-class parents who want to ensure the success of their children in life. The Church of South India has a really poor reputation for probity in its higher ranks. Part of that is caste-driven, part of that is sort of the big man culture that we see in African church corruption, where somebody, uh, well, we have a case that is quite fun the Bishop of Manicaland, Eric Ruana, was arrested by Zimbabwe police uh, in Mutare on, uh, I think it was Tuesday of this week, and uh, arraigned yesterday. And the arraignment uh, stated that he had taken out $700,000 in US dollar mortgages on church property, but he had neglected to tell the church standing committee and he had forged minutes of the standing committee to authorize this. And now the, and he had then, he and his Confederates had stolen the money. And the thing is that Ruana to stay in the power basically takes the money and then distributes it among his group of uh, people around him. And that's sort of the African model of corruption. One of the things that in the excitement of the, uh, I'm switching gears slightly, but the warning I'm trying to give is that Many people receive, some people receive emails from African bishops asking for support, for money, for this and for that. And you really need to check these guys out because it's pretty well, it's pretty clear who's dirty and who isn't. And, oh, and some of the church pol pol politicking 
the whole formation of GAFCON and whatnot, included bishops who were dirty, like the Archbishop of Tanzania, Valentin Mokiwa. Kevin and I reported uh, again and again and again on, you know, the corruption and vote buying and and we also knew that Archbishop Mokiwa had illegitimate children and was pocketing the money of his clergy who had to kick back so much of his salaries. And, you know, you couldn't write this be because of libel uh, laws. But Well, they could have, but we, we they, got over it. We, we, were, we, we, were, we got over it. Yeah. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is that just because somebody is right on human sexuality doesn't give them a pass mm. on other mm. forms of, of <laughs> corrupt behavior. And there's some people who are absolutely wrong on human sexuality who are clean as the driven snow financially mm. in other ways. Mm. Yeah, it, it, the, the sexual ethics cannot be the standard. Holiness uh, is is the standard. And uh, so I think last week we called the, the Nicodemus test is also the standard. Uh, any other news we want to cover? I know uh, Mrs. Anglican TV is getting back from her business meeting and she's going to be College of Bishops. Day. Let's do that real quick. Yes. Yep. They met in Melbourne, Florida, my, near my old stomping grounds. Mm -hmm. Nobody stopped by to say hello. I'm That's sad right. to say. No. Uh, pretty good meeting. Uh, two things I think particular note is they're doing some prayer book reform. Now, if you're an Episcopalian like me or or formerly in the Church of England like Gavin, when you hear the words prayer book reform, you put your hand over your wallet and you run because that only goes <laughs> in one direction. <laughs> Craziness. Well, the Anglican Church of North America is is authorizing a traditional language. What? Prayer Nobody book. does that. <laughs> These and thou's and wilt thou art and plight ah. thy troth, I guess. I don't know what it's going to look cool. like. That's cool. But they're uh, they're trying to expand and broaden the uh, liturgy of the church in an, in an inclusive way, but including traditionalists. I think, I think that's kind of cool, though. And the yeah. uh, and the other is that they have talked and continue to talk about women clergy, mm -hmm. and the door is not shut or closed. It's still well what, swinging back what, and forth what i do see in their statement is they've learned a lot about each other as bishops in all of this what was assumed was a you know a white and black issue uh 10 years ago or 12 years ago with the formation of the acna wasn't so white and black it was largely gray with the loudest people representing the the, the black and white of the issue and so well, let's just see, see how this goes. I think and once you learn a lot about each other, hopefully they can start learning a lot about uh, maybe the future of our church. Guys, the door is opening. That's Mrs. Anglican TV. We do need to sign off. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you'll be listening to episode 567 on the 17th of January, 2020. And Gavin, you've set your clock to the right time. <laughs> yes. <laughs>